Hi, my name's Todd Davis and I'm the solicitor in charge of the Mental Health Advocacy Service. I have worked at the MHAS for around 13 years with a couple of years on secondment to the Healthcare Complaints Commission. Before the law, I practice nursing, mainly working in intensive care, so I bring those experiences to my legal practice. The MHAS is a specialist unit within the Civil Law Division of Legal Aid. The multidisciplinary team comprising of solicitors, a lay advocate, a social worker and admin staff. In our day-to-day -day roles, we provide advice, minor assistance and representation throughout New South Wales for those affected by mental health issues. These services are also provided by legal aid lawyers based in other offices and private practitioners who are members of the Legal Aid Mental Health Panel. Mental health laws are recognised as being one of the most powerful means by which the state and its servants wield power over individuals. Not only is the person's liberty in the hands of others, but also their fundamental right to determine care and treatment. Our work is often an attempt to balance the powers given to the healthcare providers and the state with the rights of the patient. There is a constant tension between these two positions, which create fertile ground for exploring new legal solutions. The purpose of this presentation on mental health matters is to explore some of the basic principles regarding mental health law in New South Wales, discuss some of the issues in appearing before the Mental Health Review Tribunal and the Guardianship Division of NCAT, which I will refer to as the Guardianship Tribunal, and consider some fundamental aspects of the relevant legislation, regulations and procedures, and describe the expectations legal aid has when you undertake these types of matters. The MHAS practices in three jurisdictions, guardianship, mental health and involuntary drug and alcohol treatment. This talk focuses on mental health matters. Broadly speaking, there are two types of mental health matters. Firstly, there are forensic mental health matters which fall under the jurisdiction of the Mental Health Forensic Provisions Act. They mainly involve people found unfit to stand trial or not guilty by reason of mental illness prisoners detained in mental health facilities and forensic community treatment orders. MHAS solicitors appear in those forensic matters. The Mental Health Review Tribunal conduct around 19,000 hearings each year. Around 17,000 are heard by the Civil Division of the Tribunal, with around 80% of the representation provided by private practitioners and the remaining 20% is provided by legal aid lawyers working throughout New South Wales. This talk will focus on civil mental health matters, which are those which fall under the jurisdiction of the Mental Health Act and are heard by the Civil Division of the Mental Health Review Tribunal. Before appearing in mental health and guardianship matters, you should ensure you are familiar with the guidelines for panel lawyers in matters before the Mental Health Review Tribunal and the practice standards, the Mental Health Act and regulations, the Guardianship Act and Regulations, the New South Wales Trustee and Guardian Act, and the practice and procedural directions and relevant authorities. Representing people before the Mental Health Review Tribunal must be undertaken in accordance with the same fundamental duties and responsibilities as when representing a person in any other forum. When representing people experiencing mental illness, it is especially important to not lose the fundamentals of practice. The only real difference between this jurisdiction and others is here, invariably, all clients experience a disability of the mind, either an intellectual disability or a mental illness or a combination of both. The Mental Health Act makes several accommodations to foster effective representation in this situation. Examples of this include section 152 of the Mental Health Act, which states, a mental illness or intellectual disability is presumed not to be an impediment to the person being represented. This means that the fact a person does not have capacity to instruct does not mean that they will not be afforded representation. Gaining instructions and representing people usually takes place in a mental health facility which is usually attached to a public hospital. When you attend a mental health facility, Present yourself to a member of staff to confirm who you are and why you're there. You're welcome to provide your identification, the Law Society or Bar Association, 
and ask the staff to confirm the accuracy of the list or notice you were provided by the MHAS or the hospital or the roster coordinator in your area and check for any changes. Those changes include checking if patients remain on the list, the type of order, such as an involuntary patient order or a financial management order or a community treatment order and the length of the order. Next, ask for the papers relating to each patient. Once you've received the papers, you can ask to be taken to each patient who is scheduled to appear before the Mental Health Review Tribunal. It is good to find a quiet, private space to speak to each patient. This may be a courtyard, interview room or similar type of space. Do not see patients in their bedroom and avoid similar types of spaces. Always follow the advice of staff regarding safety concerns. Hospital staff should not attend a client interview. Safety concerns can often be addressed by speaking to the client in an open area, such as a courtyard where the staff may view you and the patient but not hear what is being said. When you introduce yourself to the patient, make it clear that you are their lawyer. Make sure they understand that you are separate from everybody else, including the doctors and the Mental Health Review Tribunal. Offer to represent them before the tribunal at an inquiry and tell them the service is free. Ask the patient if they would like to be represented by you. For an accessible person being presented at a mental health inquiry or a person under the age of 16 in any proceedings before the tribunal, anything but refusal to be represented means they should be represented. In all other proceedings that satisfy legal aid policy for representation, the person must indicate they wish to be represented. Inform the patient of the application and provide advice. Always make it clear that orders cannot be sought because the patient has done anything wrong or as a form of punishment. For applications for involuntary patient orders, reassure the patient that the legislation allows discharge at any time during the period of an involuntary patient order and patients must be discharged once they no longer satisfy the test for being a mentally ill person as defined by Section 12 of the Mental Health Act. While you're with the patient, you may need to read out relevant aspects of documents such as the admission documents and the doctor's report. Do not allow the patient to read the documents without having obtained the doctor's permission first. When reading the content of documents to patients, be careful regarding information that refers to third parties, such as family members, which might be damaging to patients' relationships. If the patient wants to read their reports and records and the doctor refuses, you can remind the doctor that the patient has a right to access their medical records in accordance with Section 156 of the Mental Health Act. Where the doctor continues to refuse, you may consider seeking instructions to make such an application to be heard by the tribunal at the commencement of the inquiry. Further reading of documents, including progress notes and the like, may need to be undertaken after the patient has left. It usually takes around 30 minutes to meet the patient, confirm representation, read the admission documents, provide advice, gain instructions, and undertake any further reading after the patient has left. On the day of the inquiry, arrive at the venue at least 15 minutes prior to the scheduled starting time. Confirm with a medico-legal clerk or staff member who manages the inquiries that the patients listed to appear and the respective orders have not changed from when you received your instructions, which is often the day before. Meet the patient outside the room where the inquiry will be conducted. Confirm the order being sought and the instructions that you were provided either the day prior or earlier that same day. Ensure the patient is not adversely affected by medication. If they are, refer to section 35 or 38 of the Mental Health Act and where appropriate, seek an adjournment in accordance with your instructions. At a mental health inquiry, ask the patient whether they have received a copy of their Statement of Rights as required under Section 74 of the Act. Different tribunal members often conduct their inquiries differently. Currently, the preferred approach is the tribunal asking the presenting doctor what orders they seek and then confirming with the lawyer the patient's position. That is, whether they oppose the order being sought, not oppose or have no position. Single legal members conduct mental health inquiries, while three member panels consisting of a legal member, a psychiatrist and a suitably qualified person, usually a person with a professional background in mental health care, 
conduct reviews of involuntary patients and most other proceedings. Please treat all inquiries as formal legal proceedings. If you refer to the inquiries as meetings or having a chat, it is misleading to the patient and does not reflect the reality that their liberty and autonomy are at issue. Research shows that playing down the gravity of proceedings by using these terms makes people lose confidence in the process and the decision. Similarly, conducting proceedings with the attitude of what's best for the patient results in a loss of confidence in the impartiality and fairness of the proceedings and the ultimate decision. Conversely, overly focusing on an individual's rights can result in unwanted tension. That can include overly aggressive questioning of those providing care, leading to hostility between the patient and healthcare providers. And although the tribunal is not bound by the rules of evidence, the fundamental protections those rules provide and the procedural protections provided under the legislation cannot be discarded. Therefore, you are expected to test the evidence through questioning the doctors and nurses, social workers and others, as well as the patient and often their family or friends. And where appropriate, applying that evidence to the applicable aspects of the legislation. Where possible, make opening and closing submissions. Do not be surprised if your client changes their position during proceedings and does so by informing the tribunal without confirming with you. When the client does not want to attend the inquiry or wants to leave during proceedings, this should be respected. It is common for the tribunal to attend the ward, to view a patient who does not attend the inquiry, to confirm their identity and well-being, and then conduct the remainder of the inquiry in the inquiry room. Section 47 of the Mental Health Act allows those detained under the Mental Health Act to be detained on a hospital ward rather than a gazetted mental health facility. This is because the person may need interventions that cannot be undertaken in the mental health facility, such as nasogastric feeding, intravenous hydration and electronic monitoring of physiological signs. On most occasions, you will appear in proceedings where either an involuntary patient order or a community treatment order are sought. Of the 14,000 occasions when people were represented during the 2018-2019 year, over 90% of those proceedings related to these two types of applications. When a person is involuntarily admitted to a mental health facility, the processes you are most likely to be involved in are representing patients at a mental health inquiry, which is the first appearance before the tribunal, or a section 37 review, which are conducted every three months whilst the person remains an involuntary patient, and proceedings where a community treatment order is sought. The test for making an involuntary patient order is described at section 35 of the Mental Health Act for mental health inquiries and at section 38 for involuntary patient reviews. The test is the same in both sections. There are three criteria and there needs to be a nexus between each. The first criteria is based on symptomology as described at section four of the Act as delusions, hallucinations, serious disorder of thought form or severe disturbance of mood. Focusing on symptoms rather than diagnosis protects the person from being captured by the act merely because a diagnostic label is applied to them. It also assists in the person receiving treatment based on symptoms, which is either causing the person harm or placing them at risk of harm. Diagnosing mental illness is often complex and based on symptoms over time. Testing the evidence regarding a patient's symptoms involves asking the doctor what they have observed that makes them come to the conclusion the patient has experienced such symptoms. Often the symptoms may be described as a person being delusional, which is merely an opinion. For example, I appeared for a woman who doctors believed was acting on delusions or hallucinations that led her to light candles inside her home and burn something in her backyard. On questioning the patient and her friend why she did those things, it became apparent she was merely participating in a religious practice widely undertaken by those of her faith. The second aspect of the test is based on risk. Section 14 of the Act states, As a result of the symptom, the person requires care, treatment or control 
for their own protection or for the protection of others from serious harm. What harm is and what serious means is not defined in the Act. The reference to continuing condition at section 14.2 of the Act often causes confusion and its meaning and application is not settled. Continuing condition is a consideration in determining whether the person is a mentally ill person. As such, it is not separate from the first and second tiers regarding symptomology and risk of serious harm. Rather, the 2003 Supreme Court decision of Presland and the Hunter Area Health Service indicates the term continuing condition should be applied where symptoms may have been present at the time the person was examined or appeared before the tribunal, but they appear episodically and manifested within the recent past. How recent is not determined. However, the tendency to rely on the term continuing condition must be tested if in question. In the absence of evidence of symptomology and risk within the recent past, continuing condition cannot stand alone as satisfying the second tier of the test. The third tier of the test is expressed at section 35.5 of the Act regarding mental health inquiries and section 38.4 regarding involuntary patient reviews. That aspect of the test goes to whether there is an alternative to involuntary care. Such an alternative must be capable of providing safe and effective care and be appropriate and reasonably available. An example when that might occur is when the person's family or friends are willing to support the patient if discharged and give an undertaking before the tribunal that they will ensure the patient continues treatment. They will undertake to contact the relevant people immediately if the patient deteriorates. Alternatively, where the tribunal finds the accessible person or involuntary patient is a mentally ill patient, they may order discharge into the care of their designated carer or principal care provider in accordance with section 355A or section 385 of the Act. This requires you to obtain instructions and speak to those people prior to the inquiry. You must confirm with the carer they are comfortable with the application and are available to speak to the tribunal, explaining their understanding of the patient's care and treatment. This must persuade the tribunal they will be available to provide that care. If the tribunal do not find the person a mentally ill person at the inquiry or review, they must be discharged. However, a discharge may be deferred for up to 14 days if the tribunal thinks it's in the best interest of the person. If a mental health inquiry or review is adjourned, the patient may continue to be detained as long as the doctors are satisfied the person remains a mentally ill person. In accordance with Section 44 of the New South Wales Trustee and Guardian Act, where an accessible person is found to be a mentally ill person at a mental health inquiry and ordered to be detained in a mental health facility, the tribunal must consider whether they are capable of managing their affairs. If the tribunal is not satisfied they are capable of managing their affairs, then it can make a financial management order. Also, at any other time whilst a person is admitted to a mental health facility, an application for a financial management order may be made to the tribunal on the basis the patient is not capable of managing their affairs. The tribunal can only nominate the New South Wales trustee and guardian as the financial manager. At a mental health inquiry or involuntary patient review, the tribunal may also make a community treatment order. This is also known as a CTO. A CTO sets out the terms under which a person must accept medication and therapy, counselling, management, rehabilitation and other services whilst living in the community. An involuntary patient must be discharged when a CTO is made. If the tribunal determines that it is in the best interest of the person, then the discharge may be deferred for up to 14 days. An application for a CTO is usually made because a person has not complied with treatment, especially medication, prior to their admission. The CTO requires the person to accept medication and also be examined as determined by those implementing the CTO. Under Section 51 of the Act, the Tribunal may determine an application for a CTO at any time, including while the patient is detained in a mental health facility or whilst they're in the community. The Court of Appeal found in the 1994 decision of Harry and the MHRT that the tribunal must find the person to be a mentally ill person 
to order a CTO at a mental health inquiry. It is not necessary to make such a finding at any other time, including during an involuntary patient review. A typical CTO is six months. However, in exceptional circumstances, an order can be made for up to 12 months. For example, when a person has already been subject to CTOs for several years. The Act does not allow for random drug and alcohol testing. In circumstances where there is evidence substance use was associated with a decline in mental health, the Act allows for testing if the frequency of the testing is described. For example, a urine drug screen no more than twice per month. It is important to make the person aware that if they fail to comply with the CTO, they may be detained by the police and taken to a mental health facility. In all matters, consideration should be given to the objects of the Act under Section 3 and the principles under Section 68. Wider consideration should also be given to the United Nations principles of persons with mental illness and the improvement of mental health care. And it cannot be forgotten that all people who experience mental illness live with a disability. As such, they are captured by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This presentation is merely an introduction to the procedures, practices and law for the most common types of proceedings conducted before the Mental Health Review Tribunal. You are expected to have read and understand the guidelines for panel lawyers in matters before the Mental Health Review Tribunal, the practice standards, as well as the relevant legislation, regulation, authorities, before undertaking any of this work. The MHRT website is a good source of information, especially regarding procedural matters, and it contains the Tribunal's published decisions. Appearing before the MHRT can be difficult and frustrating for many reasons. These include conducting legal proceedings in a healthcare environment, dealing with people who are confused and scared, but often cannot understand your best explanation, and a natural tendency for discord to arise, where healthcare practitioners are driven by what's in the person's best interest from a healthcare perspective, whereas legal considerations and tests don't leave much room for such consideration. This means crafting an approach that maintains the legal requirements in a manner that accommodates the jurisdiction's unique nature. At the end of the day, the utility of these proceedings must be justified, especially in regard to the provision of legal representation. Research and critique undertaken by people such as Ian Freckleton, Terry Carney and Fleur Beaupair, amongst many others, conclude the positive effects that flow from undertaking a legal process that include legal representation. On their own, legal proceedings cannot be seen as therapeutic. However, ensuring the norms of legal practice and procedure are applied leads to confidence in the reasons why care and treatment are needed and applied using coercive powers. A good hearing most often follows proceedings where the patient's position is thoroughly and openly prosecuted and you are able to represent that person in a manner where they have some confidence in the final decision 